Hello, fellow flower farmers. Today we are going to be discussing a very, very important topic, and that is thrips. For such an important topic, I have my lab coat on, my pointer, as well as a presentation. This will hopefully be the first of many in a series that I'm gonna call Flower Farming Science Classroom. So let's get started. Now, I personally believe that in order to fully understand what treatment solution we should be pursuing, we need to take a deeper dive into these following topics. So first, we're gonna talk about the biology and reproductive cycle of thrips. Then we're gonna talk about weather variables, then how they damage crops, how they arrive on crops, treatment solutions, and of course, some question and answers that I've seen some of you guys put out there on Instagram. But let's first talk about what makes thrips the bane of many flower farmers' existence. Thrips are these really, really small, tiny creatures. We're talking about millimeters in length and they crawl around, but they also have wings. Now in the flower farming world, we are usually particularly concerned with two types of thrip species. There are over 6,000 thrip species of which a hundred or so are known to be pests. And in the flower farming world, we specifically care about the Western flower thrip or WFT as well as the gladiolus thrips. Now, gladiolus thrips are exactly what they sound like. They overwinter on gladiolus bulbs. You might have already had an infestation if you grow gladiolus or gladioli, but the Western flower thrip has a wide range of hosts, including anything that really has pollen. Typically, we will see them on our snapdragons, our feverfew, ranunculus, sweet william, campanula. They will literally feast on anything. And herein lies the problem. They are small, stealthy, and they reproduce really, really quickly. They have a sweet spot in terms of temperature. They really, really like it when it gets warm and when there is the sweet spot of humidity. It can't be too humid, but the humidity can go up to 70% and that is where they thrive. So that is why you start seeing thrips at the end of early spring or at the end of spring and in the beginning of early summer. That's when they come out and they have the ability to overwinter in our soils. They have the ability to basically just hang out during temperatures that are under 50 degrees Fahrenheit, wait until the right conditions are met and then they come out and then they start multiplying. So let's start talking about their reproductive cycle and their biology. This here is a reproductive life cycle graphic that I think is really important to look at because it helps us understand the timing of their reproductive cycle. Now, thrips go through various stages and basically they start off as an egg. So after 50 degree Fahrenheit conditions are met or above 50 degree Fahrenheit conditions, they start laying, they start their lives as eggs. They spend about two to four days as eggs. And then afterwards they become larva. Then they have another phase where they're not doing much. They're just hanging out as larva before they become into the adult phase. Now at this point, when they become an adult, they are able to reproduce. So very interesting about thrips is the fact that they can reproduce sexually and asexually. That means they don't necessarily need to mate in order to reproduce. Even more interesting is the fact that if there is no mate, the offspring are more likely to become female. And if there is a mate, then the offspring are more likely to become male. But predominantly, the offspring are actually going to favor female, which means a lot more egg laying potential. Now, even worse is how quickly they can reproduce. At the height of summer, we're looking at anywhere from a two to three week window for them to reproduce. And with each adult thrips laying anywhere from 150 to 300 eggs, that is a lot of thrips. So we're looking at a total of maybe eight generations in a single growing season. That means that what be, what was a very small infestation can exponentially grow big very, very quickly. Let's now talk about weather variables. I already touched upon heat and humidity. They like it to be humid, but not too humid. And they like temperatures that are above 50 degrees with a sweet spot in 70 to 80 degree Fahrenheit range. But I have not yet talked about rainfall. Rainfall and precipitation are actually our friends here. So 
too much heavy rain, especially in a short period of time, can actually help drown the larva, which means that we are disrupting their breeding cycle if there is a lot of rain. Furthermore, enough rain can actually saturate the wings so that the thrips can't fly away. Now, our problem this year has been, it's been really, really dry. It's been a warmer than usual spring, compounded with the fact that we have not had our usual May rains. So when you add those two together, the thrips were really, really happy. And once those temperatures regularly hit above 50 degrees, especially at night, they came out with a vengeance. And that is why seemingly overnight, I went from seeing zero thrips to millions of thrips, or that's what it feels like on my fever view. Now let's touch very briefly on how thrips damage our crops. In the pest world, there are really two primary ways in which pests damage crops. The first way is they chew on leaves, and then the second way is that they suck the moisture out of leaves. Thrips belong in this sucking category. And so what that means is that you might see discoloration of leaf buds, you might see some damage to the plant because they are unable to produce healthy blooms or stems. From my personal experience, my thrips issue has always been cosmetic. My plants still look fine. Maybe there's a bit of discoloring on the leaves, but they are still usable, except for the fact that you've got these tiny little things crawling all over the blooms. And in my view, that makes it completely unsellable, especially for an ornamental where people are prizing the look of the bud. Now, the other thing to note over here is they can actually transmit viruses, two specific viruses here. The impatience necrotic spot virus is a virus that has a wide range of hosts for ornamental plants. And then the tomato spotted wilt virus is more applicable if you're growing vegetables, especially nightshades. Regardless of what you're growing, these viruses are very serious and they do do a lot of damage, especially in the vegetable world. So one thing about thrips in terms of not only managing an infestation cosmetically is to manage them so that there is no transmission of the virus or we're trying to limit that transmission. How do thrips actually arrive on our crops though? There are two main ways that they arrive on our crops. The first is that they overwinter in our soils. Now, from what I'm told, where I live in New Jersey, in 6B, they actually did not overwinter here. It was too cold. With climate change, that is changing. And where do they overwinter? They overwinter in the soil, but they also overwinter in a lot of weeds. So we have a spectacular amount of clover here, especially on my property. It is so clovery that it looks like there is snow on the ground when you look far away after the cloves have budded. And a local farmer told me that basically if you shake off the clove flower heads, you'll actually see thrips in there. So I have a feeling that's where my personal infestation came from, but they will also overwinter in things like alfalfa, wheat, rye. So things that we might actually plant as cover crops might also be homes for them over the winter. The other thing to note, as you can see over here, they have wings. They can fly even though it's more like hopping around, but besides the ability to hop around through their wings, they actually can travel huge distances through the wind. And this is why in a greenhouse, after they have eradicated a thrips infestation, assuming they're not bringing in new plant material that has a thrips infestation, they can still have thrips because of the way that thrips can migrate, especially through the wind. So if you've got weeds outside that have thrips, if you've got a neighbor close by who has thrips, these are all things that you want to consider if you have a serious thrips infestation. Even if you get rid of your current infestation, it does not guarantee you that you are not going to have an infestation going forward. I've set all of that up to get to the most important topic that is on your mind likely, which is treatment options. Now, what I'm going to say is not going to be a great solution because there is no silver bullet. Thrips are one of the worst pests to deal with. They are notoriously difficult to eradicate. And basically you need the chemical big guns in order to do it. And even then people who spray chemical insecticides have a lot of issues fully eradicating thrips. And one thing that is becoming more and more common is thrips developing resistance to these chemical sprays. 
I was watching a YouTube video of a Kenyan rose grower who was working with Syngenta. And basically they said that they spent about 30% of their chemical insecticides budget on just trying to eradicate thrips. That's how big of an issue thrips are for those rose growers. Now, when it comes to chemical insecticides, I mentioned that there is a possibility of the thrips developing resistance. And when they develop resistance, then you are no longer able to spray and treat the thrips with that particular spray. So if this is the route that you have to go on, this is not the route that I personally would go on because I have a no spray mentality, whether it's synthetic or organic, but I understand that some people's livelihoods depend on selling these crops you make sure that you are alternating between two different agents, as well as making sure that you are spraying among and within generations. I definitely recommend you checking out the Syngenta YouTube video that I talked about. I will link it in the description below, but here is a graph that they had that I thought was really helpful in helping understand what I'm talking about in terms of spraying within and among generations. All of the arrow colors are different types of spring agents. So you can see that they are alternating between the different types of agents, but also alternating within the generations and they're not stopping after just one generation. The point is that even after your thrips infestation looks like it's gone, you need to continue spraying. So that is definitely worth checking out. And you just have to make sure that you are doing your research, getting your license if needed, if you are handling these kind of products. So now let's talk about a more natural treatment option, which is the one that I'm assuming most of us are going to gravitate towards, and that is called Integrated Pest Management or IPM. The main benefit of something like Integrated Pest man Management is that you never hear of a pest developing resistance to a predator. So there are typically two types of things that are deployed when it comes to thrips. The first is something called predatory nematodes or beneficiary nematodes, and the second are predatory beneficials. So let's talk about beneficial nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic worms that are basically hunters in the soil. You buy them in a package, you put them in water, and then you apply it in the soil in the form of a drench. And that is the limitation with beneficial nematodes. They work their magic underneath the soil. So if you already have an outbreak on your blooms, on your petals, it is not going to take care of those thrips on the blooms. But what it can take care of is disrupting that reproductive cycle because those nematodes are going to hunt down thrip pupae in the soil and help break up that cycle. Now, beneficial nematodes are best used as a proactive measure, especially in the early spring, to prevent you from even having that initial outbreak. You might still have some thrips, but it might be held at bay with beneficial nematodes. Now, let's say you're like me, you did not apply beneficial nematodes, and now you have a thrips infestation. What next? You can bring in some of these beneficial predators. So things like mites, pirate bugs, ladybugs, and green lacewing flies are all predators that are known to eat thrips. From talking with local farmers, people really prefer bringing in the mites as well as the pirate bugs. And a local farmer also said that she really prefers the mites because they will consume all stages of the thrip life cycle. So from the larva to the adult, and they will basically stay in place versus flying off because most of these other predators have wings and they can fly off. Now, for me personally, I have done a lot to attract beneficial insects. In fact, I have seen a ton of ladybug, including ladybug larva. larva. I have also seen green lace uh, flies as well, or green lace wings. And today I spotted the first pirate bug. So I have a feeling that nature is going to help me with this thrips infestation, but I don't think it is going to be enough to take care of everything. So my current course of action is we are projected to get a decent amount of rain over the next week. I'm gonna wait to see what happens. We did get some rain the other day. It was only about an inch, but that inch came within a two hour time span. The next morning when I went out, the thrips were almost all gone, but lo and behold, 
they returned in the evening. So that rain did not resolve my thrips issue. I'm hoping it did knock down some of the larva population by drowning them. So I'm gonna see what happens with the rest of the rain, but it's very likely that I will need to weed whack down my fever few as well as my snapdragon. I'm going to apply beneficial nematodes and I'm gonna hold off on buying these predator uh, beneficials because I already have a decent amount outside. One of the most popular su suggestions that I got when I posted on Instagram about my thrips issue is how about spraying with neem oil? Now, I think there are a lot of well-intentioned farmers who want to farm organically, but the first thing that they always go to is neem oil when there is any kind of infestation. And to me, that is a ready, shoot, aim approach. Because how does neem oil work? Neem oil, while naturally occurring and it is a pesticide that is natural, it still is toxic and it does not discriminate between the beneficials versus the pests. But the problem is that it works by coating the insect with the oil to suffocate them so that they cannot breathe. Remember what I said earlier about thrips? They are stealthy, they are small, and it is impossible to find every single thrip and coat them with a spray of neem oil. So what that means is that you are going to miss some of the thrips. They are going to still be able to reproduce. Remember how quickly they can reproduce. So neem oil here actually does not really work in this application. And the other problem is that even if you were to spray under the leaves, which is where a lot of these thrips like to hang out, the leaves, that's where their stomata are. That's how they breathe. So you are also going to compromise the ability for the plant to also breathe. So let's add up this equation over here. Some thrips left unsprayed, compromising a plant's ability to breathe and killing off some beneficial uh, predators. You're better off not spraying with neem oil, in my opinion. And I would say that the majority of people who have tried to spray with neem oil, sometimes there is success and sometimes there isn't. Another question that I had actually personally asked myself and I got from some other people on Instagram is, can I use an infested plant as a trap crop? And I am leaning towards the answer no over here because remember, again, a thrips can reproduce very, very quickly. You don't want them alive more for more time than you really need to. And this is why for me, if it weren't raining this week, I would actually be mowing down all of my fever few as well as my snapdragon. I have seen some fever few that has not yet looked like it's been infested with thrips. And I'm trying to give the beneficial insects some time to prey on the thrips. But at the end of the day, if you have a patch that is heavily, heavily infested, you're not seeing any beneficials. I personally would recommend taking that out, if not at least mowing it to stem length, because at least for me, fever few and snapdragons can give me a second flush, if not in the fall, but next year. And then I would also apply some beneficial nematodes to make sure that you are taking care of any issues down in the soil. The last Q and A question I have over here is one that I have actually done before. And that is, can I basically swirl an infested bloom of thrips into a bucket of soapy water to get rid of those thrips and sell it? And look, the answer is technically yes. No one's going to stop you from doing that. I personally am going to stop doing that. I only did it for a couple of times last year with my Snapdragons. I actually started growing open face snap varieties like Madame Butterfly because it was a lot easier to see if I had a thrips issue. When you have Snapdragons with the traditional closed throat, it becomes really difficult to see if you have thrips, but also to get rid of them if you're gonna put them into soapy water. Now, the main reason why I'm gonna stop doing this is because I learned that thrips basically will feed on any houseplant and they especially love monstera. So what plant loving person doesn't have a monstera in their house? I wanna make sure that if people were to bring their flowers from me into their homes and accidentally put it next to their houseplant, their houseplant is not going to get infested. And furthermore, I wanna make sure that people have a really good experience with local flowers. That is, that's important to me. I don't want them to be turned off because they see insects and basically go off to the grocery store to buy something that has been heavily sprayed. Now, I think it's one thing to sell a stem that has an aphid or two there without you knowing, and it's another thing to sell something that is fully infested with thrips. Now, that being said, I now have a lot more 
crop out there in terms of what I can use. I'm not in a pinch with blooms. Again, some people may not have enough blooms or their livelihoods may depend on it. So this is a decision that you have to make for yourself. My conclusion after doing hours and hours of research is that thrips are a problem for a lot of people. You are not the only one who is dealing with thrips. The problem is as it becomes hotter faster, our springs are very ephemeral. As it becomes drier, last year at this time we had a lot more rainfall and then we headed into a drought in the summer. This year it felt like late spring was already a drought. These things compounded with the fact that we actually did not have high humidity led to me having a thrips infestation. I know that many people around the US and the world have experienced higher pest pressure this year than in previous years. And one of those pests are thrips. The other is usually aphids. So with thrips, you're never going to get rid of all of them, all of them. And some other people have said, Hey, have you heard about the BRICS index and listening to the no tills farmer podcast with Jenny love? And my answer is yes. In fact, I have known about BRICS since my vegetable growing days and I own a refractometer. What I find is that the healthier a plant is, it is true. It is able to ward off pests, but this is more applicable in the beginning of the season. In fact, in the beginning of the season, if you have a strong, healthy plant, it's going to hold off disease. It's going to hold off pests. But at a certain point, there is going to be so much pest pressure that I find that even they eventually might have a few pests here and there. So what are things that we can do to proactively prevent thrip outbreak? If you want to use natural methods, the takeaway is that you really need to be proactive. There is a larger local farm who only practices integrated pest management. They don't do any kinds of sprays, including organic sprays. And what they do is they release beneficial nematodes on a weekly basis, sometimes bi-weekly for proactive measures. Then they release the predatory mites. And they said that that helps keep the thrips pressure at bay. They are growing in a hoop house where it is more difficult to attract those beneficial predators. Now, the good thing about growing in a hoop house or even outside, if you bring in these beneficial predators is that you might actually be building a population of these over time, and then you may not need to buy as many. I personally don't love to buy things like ladybugs because they have to harvest those ladybugs from somewhere. So for me growing outside, it makes it a lot easier for me to create conditions to attract them to my field. And for me, if I were to spray anything, especially something like a neem, which is deemed natural, but still a pesticide at the end of the day, it wipes out all of that effort. So I am personally willing to let a few rows of fever few completely go and in exchange still keep my beneficial predators present. And those few rows of fever few, I was really counting on them. It's not like it wasn't a lot of flowers for me. I estimate that I have close to about at least 120 feet worth of fever few. They were one of the most um, excited crops that I overwintered. I was really looking forward to them. And it's very likely I won't really get to use stems from that crop. So if this video was helpful for you, if you've learned something, if in the past uh, something that I've said has helped make you money, consider joining my Patreon. I just started a Patreon and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start creating written content that complements videos like this. So you can check out a version of what that would look like. I made a public version of the written complimentary article to go with this thrips video at this link over here. I'll also link it in the description below so that you can click directly to it. It has a lot more information. It links to the YouTube video that I talked about with Syngenta. It talks about some of the studies that I reference, and it gives a bit more detail. So the goal is that over time with these YouTube videos, I can provide you a lot more information and also edit or update those articles as time goes on and I learn more because it's really hard for me to edit a video. I would have to make a completely new video to update anything that I learn. Now, let me know in the comments below if you have figured out any integrated pest management techniques that have worked for you or any other natural alternatives that have helped with your thrips infestation. And hopefully I will see you in the next flower farming classroom science video.